be at all the good trip here. It took me three hours door to door from Eindhoven to get here in the morning. Uh, but I'm very excited to be here because uh, I think the subject smart grids is one of the most uh, intriguing subjects in the whole sustainable energy field. Uh, why do I say that? There's still a lot of ground to be uh, explored and it's not a straightforward roadmap towards the future. And that's kind of the, the, the general message I have today in this, uh, this presentation. Um, being in Kicker in, in the Energy, I will explain the organization a bit uh, in a bit more detail in a few slides. Um, I see a lot of things in the energy field. Uh, and then you have on the one hand renewables, for example, where you say, okay, we're going to improve the solar uh, panels, and that's kind of a straightforward roadmap towards cost reduction. Uh, and then you look at the smart grid subject, um, and you see all kinds of um, influences uh, which are not clear and to be discovered. Yeah? So, how fast is electric vehicle penetration going to be, for example? What regulations are going to change uh, in the near future? So from that perspective, it makes it really hard to predict uh, where this market is going, other than being kind of global on, okay, the energy system has to change, so things will change. Um, so therefore, for this presentation, I took kind of another perspective. Instead of saying, um, we have to go in that direction, I kind of say, okay, what are the uh, startups that we have in our portfolio today? Uh, what are they working on? Uh, what is their market technology and society readiness? And what can we learn from that uh, going forward? Um, so it's less on um, a pilot project or uh, experimenting. It's far more on actual startups trying to make business. And uh, I think that's that's an, could be an interesting topic to explore further. So who has all heard about Kick in our energy? Who not? So most of you know. So I will. Just be brief about this. Uh, origin of Kicks is uh, under the umbrella of uh, Horizon 2020. You have the subsidy part, yeah, where we are subsidizing companies to do uh, innovation. Um, and the other part are the Kicks, and the Kicks are more an investment vehicle where we say um, we don't want to spend the money and then uh, create jobs by subsidies. No, we will kind of want to have the money back so we can uh, invest it in other companies later. So what we typically do is uh, we invest. We take either a revenue share or uh, we take a stake in the actual company we invest in and the idea is that when it's 2020 and the money from the European Union uh, is not low, no longer funding the, funding the gigs, the gigs can sustain themselves uh, with the investments they made earlier. Uh, we found it by a number of uh, partners and these partners are actual stakeholders so it's not that we are partnering and uh, just cooperating, no they are stakeholders so they have an extra share in the company so they are also involved in the success and that's how we work. So we work uh, towards the companies we support, we take a share. So their success is our success, and our partners also take a share in us, so our success is also the success of our partners. Now, if you can see, it's a really a mix of industry partners, but also knowledge institutes. And we think when we cover knowledge institutes, industries and startups, we can cover the main part of the ecosystem. Obviously, it's never complete, so we always look for new partners to be involved. So what are our activities? Um, we work in a, we call it the magic, uh, magic triangle, uh, where we say, on the one hand, we are doing education. Yeah? So we are educating the future game changers of this industry. So we have master programs, PhD programs for young people coming from universities and want to do more with uh, entrepreneurship uh, in the environment. On the other hand, we have the innovative uh, products and services. These are typically the innovation projects where you see a consortium of partners working together in the research, uh, more of a less environment, where we say, okay, we did the last step to the market. So a lot of new research has been done. Now this consortium has to go to the market, we fund it. Those, um, that's the biggest money that we see. Then we have the new business startups. That's the part where I'm working for. Uh, and that's also kind of the focus of today's presentation. If you look at the teams that we're working on, you see uh, renewables. Obviously, uh, clean coal, not so obvious if you talk about uh, sustainability. Um, smart grids, obviously, energy from chemical fuels, and smart buildings and storage solutions. So for this presentation, I thought, okay, what can we do to make this interesting? Can we combine this part? Yeah? So not, we don't start from innovation projects where we say, okay, we have pilot projects and we do uh, something once. No, we really look at 
which are the young businesses actually making money right now doing business in this field. So I think there are the business opportunities because it's not about doing a pilot, it's about making money in the end to make it sustainable. Um, and then I take from our portfolio, if you look at the portfolio of 900 applicants to date, 90 ventures we support in 11 European countries, so 11 regulations also, um, and 25% smart grids. So then you have kind of a sample size which you can say, okay, this is something we talk about. Um, but I don't say uh, we are elaborate. And there's so far more ventures and smart grids, of course, in Europe. But I kind of stick to our portfolio because I know them best and uh, can help. So can you predict the future? Open question. Yeah? So who is here? I see a lot of people, uh, and they all look very intelligent, actually. <laughs> Uh, we want to take a shot at predicting the future of smart grids in a few lines. Where, where, where are we going? It's a glass ball. It's a yeah. That's how it looks to me, actually. But, uh, but I've also said in the introduction, I'm not a technical expert. I'm coming from marketing economics field and look at from making business, not so much from uh, driving certain technology. So uh, maybe from a technology roadmap, inside view, people have an idea of where this is going. Somebody? I have the impression that they that they will try to match very well uh, supply and demand. The best optimal way, uh, also in terms of cost. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's uh, that's also I think the the right starting point. Yeah? That's why we uh, why we have smart grids. Um, yeah, uh, the convergence of IT in the energy sector will be going together and it will be interesting to see who will be the dominating the market uh, within a few years. Huh? Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. Starting from the point of matching supply and demand, then of course you need IT because you need to understand what is supply, what is demand. You need to match it. And I think the last thing you also mentioned is uh, that who's going to do it, eh? who's in the end going to be the, uh, the leader uh, in this area. Um, so we also don't know, uh, so to speak, yeah? So I, what I said for us is also a bit of a glass ball. And why is that? Because I see this big challenge. Yeah? This is our uh, nice uh, little creature here. Um, it's an intelligent creature, yeah? so it's a smart, uh, smart animal. Uh, but it will also eight arms moving in all kinds of directions. Uh, and that's kind of how I feel also when I look at a uh, smart grid. It's not one challenge you need to solve. It's not one cost down on a certain technology you need to solve. It's different uh, things moving in different directions. Just to give a few, and it's really also not uh, all of them, but just a few where you see that, uh, of course, you have the supply volatility and the demand volatility you need to solve. But there are also new requirements for DSOs on uh, controlling the voltages levels at certain, uh, uh, yeah, really down in the grid, where it was only on DSO level first, now it's also on DSO level uh, coming there. Customer empowerment becoming more important. So what is that going to be actually and what are end consumers uh, who also produce energy, what is their role uh, going to be in this whole thing, what I said in the beginning, electric vehicle penetration, we can guess that electric vehicles become more important, but how big is that going to be, uh, what is going to be the impact exactly, uh, we don't know. So we see eight arms moving in all kinds of directions, sometimes getting tangled up, sometimes totally independent. So then, from kick we look at this perspective from a roadmap, but then from a re reversed roadmap. I worked with Philips before, um, and uh, Philips is also related to, for example, ASML, uh, and I really have this uh, technological background where you say, okay, we are developing technology in a certain way, and we maybe put a um, mark on the map, and we say, okay, we have to develop this, this, and this to get there. And we say we do it reversed. Uh, first, because we don't develop anything ourselves, and we're a small organization, so we're depending on other people to, to develop something on the roadmap, but also because we say it's kind of a complex uh, ecosystem. So what we do is we look at all the innovation projects that are out there, we look at our industry partners, where they're working on, we look at startups, where they're working on, and those we're going to plot on the map to see what's going to happen. Now this is um, just the first, or just a view on the roadmap, what it, what it then looks like. And it's really not uh, my intention by, by putting this on the slide to say, okay, this is going to happen, uh, far from that. But just to give an idea, okay, what's going to, what's kind of our starting point, we have to say, 
smart meters are the starting point for smart grids. That's kind of uh, one thing we know. Yeah, done. Are these the 90 projects you mentioned? Uh, for no, 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 no. So the um, 90 projects I mentioned are in different uh, uh, areas, not only smart grid. So I would say uh, 25 projects of the startups are in smart grid. And then we have, I think, uh, 10 to 15 innovation projects also in smart grid. So we have like 40 projects we uh, we use to build a roadmap, but also the insights of our industry partners like ABB, uh, which is really big involved in uh, building the roadmap and certain knowledge institute. So it's not. So are these the projects you. I, I'm, I'm lost in the sense you get yeah. 90 projects. Yeah. Uh, how do the 90 projects relate to this? Because now you mentioned that there are also other projects. Okay, no, so, so the, the, the 90 know. projects, so the, let's not talk about projects if we talk about the 90, because 90 are ventures. So we are supporting startups. So there are 90 startups in our whole portfolio, and these 90 startups though, who are not only working on smart grids, but they also work on renewables, they work on smart cities, they work on energy efficient buildings, they work on certain devices. So it's not uh, that these 90 I mentioned are really startups. If I look at the roadmap, I say, okay, we have the input from startups, some of them, we have input from innovation projects, we have input from industry partners, the stakeholders I mentioned in the beginning. So and cluster areas. Uh, so you are going to cluster certain things. Yeah, so these are not called projects, but because if you look at uh, smart meters, I will come back on that. Uh, we have like four or five startups working on smart meters and uh, getting data from smart meters and uh, doing certain things. So these are not projects, they are just cluster areas on the road. And what I said is not, for me, it's something that's like set in stone, it's just a view of how we look at uh, the roadmap. And then you see that the really demand response and integration of electric vehicles is. Um, we see that more farther out. Um, ice landing and storage, it's a bit kind of a mid long term type of thing. But if you then, fo then this is, we use as a roadmap kind of to focus on certain areas where we say, okay, these focus areas come from our prioritization uh, based on what is closer, what is longer, uh, where are our partners, and what can we really do. And then we see uh, four focus areas the smart trans transmission grid. Um, so smart, grid, so smart uh, grids are sometimes uh, mistaken by only focusing on distribution grid. We also see that that's, uh, the transmission grid is important. And the materials for that um, smart distribution grid, what I said, and the storage as a tool for network uh, flexibility. For today, my focus is on these two. Because if I look at startups, and uh, my focus is startups, they're not really working on these two at least not in our portfolio. What I see on the transmission side and innovation projects going on there, 80% of the projects uh, is for us involvement of ABB, the big industry uh, giant basically. Um, and the startups are really far more on the smart distribution grid and on the storage. So what are startups on our roadmap? So now I'm going to talk about uh, six startups just in different areas of the uh, smart uh, distribution grid and kind of a storage uh, to see where they are yeah, in terms of market readiness, technology readiness, and then also in terms of roadblocks. So what can we then learn about maybe other opportunities that are in that space, or is it already a business opportunity as well? So what I said, everything started with smart metering for us, uh, and we have four kind of four ventures in our portfolio in smart metering. Uh, interesting to see there right away is that most of them are in Sweden, and why is that? Because Sweden already has 100% uh, smart meter penetration and also uh, flexible billing. And those two elements to me are really critical uh, to really start a smart grid. Uh, and I think Sweden has now already taken a head start on the rest of Europe, and not including Italy, but the rest of Europe, um, with innovation. Yeah? Because if you put these two things in place, smart billing, uh, and it's 100% uh, smart meter uh, penetration, you can open up so much opportunities for startups to do certain things. Um, and it's just a pity, I think, that we are kind of uh, lagging behind. Uh, one I pick now is Ipsum. Um, and I, the reason I put the Christmas lights on the background, their mission is basically to be as accurate as possible, so they say, on the LED level in a Christmas light. Uh, Per second, we can measure the energy usage in a house. And uh, what they found out is that every uh, device has a certain uh, signature. 
So they can say, not even if television is on, but they can say, uh, your Samsung television is on, and even the type of your Samsung television that you have is on. And they cannot say it only because uh, it went one hour or five minutes, they say we go to minutes and we go to seconds that we can do. So really, really, really granular. And what you can see, um, it's opening up other opportunities. And so it's no longer just say, okay, what am I using? Because that question you can answer already. To me, it's going to why are we using certain energy? Yeah? And then you can make see patterns in data, and you can combine maybe the data from the energy meter with other sensors in the house, with a smart house. Yeah? And then you get extra uh, information that you don't have before, but and that helps you to give a better energy advice uh, in the end. Uh, but also opening up business other business business models. What they are saying, I don't think I believe it yet. But uh, they say, for example, uh, why can the television not be sold per minute? Huh? So you only pay for the time that you use your television uh, instead of that you buy a television. It's a crazy idea, I would say, but it's just triggering kind of the new business models that are possible when you're going to measure that granular, that granular level. So what is the roadblock, uh, growth, I call it growth block, um, standardization. So they came to us, they said, Okay, we want to roll this out to other countries, but we have a problem that every country has different uh, standards when it comes to smart meters. Uh, so that's really, in my opinion, if you look at it from a European perspective, it's a huge uh, growth block for these type of smart metering uh, companies. Standardization. Uh, second thing. Okay, so you have smart meter data, or you have data at least about energy use, and you have it really on a minute by minute level, for example, and you're also going to build minute by minute, then you open up a whole range of new possibilities. So in the, in the Benelux, supermarkets already have these flexible energy contracts. Households don't have it yet, but supermarkets have. So what uh, one of the entrepreneurs in our program has developed, the thumb fuse controller for refrigerators in supermarkets. 50% of the energy used in supermarkets is cooling. Yeah? So we can control the lights, we can control the heating uh, and the ventilation and air conditioning, but we cannot control intelligently yet refrigerators. And that's exactly what he has uh, found out, how to do it. So it's really demand shifting, what he's doing in a, in a refrigerator. You can imagine milk has to be between, I think, 4 degrees and 12 degrees continuously, but it don't always have to be 4 degrees. So what he's saying is, I'm looking forward to the, uh, my algorithm is looking forward to the energy prices on the market. And I see, okay, uh, energy is going to be expensive in an hour from now. So what I will do now is I switch off the cooling and I let the temperature go up from 5 degrees all the way up to maybe 9 degrees. And then when the energy becomes cheaper, I start to cool deeper again. So we're playing with the demand, the energy, based on the flexible pricing. Uh, supermarkets can earn this invention back in two years. Yeah, this flexible pricing is that minute for minute, or it is, it's real time, uh, but the, the energy cost is on, on the markets, plus maybe cost for, uh, for uh, transport and distribution. Yeah, so they look at uh, the spot price on the market, yes. But they get it at every moment. Yeah, it's, I mean, the, the, the point is that the uh, um, uh, the energy contract of each supermarket is, uh, is kind of a secret, uh, so it's not even exactly clear what they have discussed with their uh, utility, but it, for sure it's flexible and I think it's minute by minute. Uh, how, how far is the superstar in what uh, development phase are they? They are now uh, doing a field test at Colmet. Uh, currently. Is it technical or commercial? Technical, and yet I think it's. Uh, okay, two things. Uh, you you want to interrupt? I want to say that uh, after the presentations in the morning, we will have a question and answer session right before the lunch. So maybe it's easier that. No, yeah, I'm happy that there are questions for okay. me easier. <laughs> uh, now, the, the, this particular case, uh, this is coming from a TNO, a Dutch organization, a Vito, uh, probably all known to you, uh, research uh, project, where they developed the algorithm uh, to, do this, uh, to do this type of demand shifting. It's uh, already field tested in a, a German uh, bigger cold store, and so there it's really on a larger scale. 
Um, and now it's applied to supermarkets for the first time. The field test is right now, uh, what I said, the call right. So that's really the technical uh, feasibility. If the payback time within two years is actually feasible, as you know, it's purely about payback time. So it's not about any more uh, acceptance from the supermarket. Do we want this? Yes or no? They really make the business case based on is it bringing money? Yes or no? So that you see in the professional market a lot, and also a takeaway thing. In the consumer market, you have maybe more uh, sentimental and emotional uh, decisions that have been taken. In the professional market, what we really see is just a business case decision. I make an investment, can I earn it back in two years? Yes, can I not earn it back? Then I don't want your product. And the two years is really that strict in supermarkets, actually. So, next step we have. Uh, data, we have flexible billing, we can use the flexibility to shift our demands. Uh, what can we do with the flexibility in our uh, supply also? Yeah? So if you have local generation, can we store it also local? There we see of course that uh, Tesla came with this uh, power wall, which I heard about four times in one week uh, from people who didn't know anything about energy. Uh, so that was, I think, a great uh, example of an uh, entrepreneur jumping into a subject which triggers people uh, and passing, in terms of, at least mentally, a lot of other entrepreneurs working on the subject already for years and being busy with bringing technology to the market. And then someone comes out and says, okay, you have something, here it is, the first mover advantage, uh, what you see. Uh, in this case, we have a venture. Um, who claims to have levelized cost of energy storage of uh, 5 cents per kilowatt hour in 2017, which is a factor 3 cheaper than lithium-ion uh, can do in 2017. Um, focusing on the segment, not households, but focusing on the segment uh, small businesses. Yeah, so not utility scale and not household scale, the in-between segment. Yeah, so this typical use case, uh, they have a windmill, or they have a few have solar panels, Okay, do they want to bring it back to the grid or do they want to grid, uh, have grid independency? Um, that's where he is playing with. Um, here's the biggest growth book, really technology readiness. Yeah? So they are now, I think, TRL5. So first sale is done. Field test is going to be uh, in the winter this year. And then they have to move from there. <coughs> I think good to know also is that on a, even on a lower TRL level, this venture is able to get capital, commercial capital. Yeah? And for me, commercial capital is always an uh, indicator of uh, readiness kind of for the market. When uh, you can attract commercial capital, means that within a certain shorter time, people expect a revenue. Yeah? If you look at government money, it's a bit slower and like, okay, we invest with a horizon of maybe five to 10 years. If you really attract commercial capital, people expect this could be something within five years. So therefore I say time to scale, I would say five years. Innovatus is I think the most uh, uh, known venture most likely within uh, this community here. It's one of the ventures in our portfolio was really fast. From coming in to scaling up to a certain uh, sales level where they are now uh, and scaling up with people. Uh, so that shows they were hitting something that was not there yet in the market. And what is that? Okay, so we have now storage, we have data, we have all the things I mentioned before, but how are you going to make money out of it? And how are you going to make the links between the different elements in this whole ecosystem? That's what they offer, software as a service. So they offer the software building blocks actually that allows these local producers or these electric vehicle users or these utilities to make money uh, with the software. Here the growth block is for me growing beyond pilot projects. So how do you make money today? It's not by selling software licenses, but it's by engineering services because they're continuously involved in pilot projects where they do the engineering services, they make it once. Uh, but for scalability, what they will need is not pilot projects, but it's really larger scale projects. So you can say either hey, it's a matter of time um, I would say it's a matter of time, actually. Next thing, so this is, I took this venture in because it's showing that um, 
it's going so much beyond the traditional energy sector, uh, the smart grids. Um, we already see uh, storage solutions, uh, data, uh, telecom involved, and here it's really about security because you're building this software, uh, you're building these data structures, but how are you going to protect these data structures and this software? Uh, in the energy sector, I don't think there is much knowledge about this. So really there's also a gap for startups, SMEs, to jump in this. Yeah? Having the knowledge about data security, having knowledge about software uh, security, cyber security, and build something applicable to a smart grid architecture. This is actually one venture from Sweden. And then the last one, um, and for me this is a bit uh, farther out than the other ones, and this is really about thermal storage, uh, seasonal storage. And so we have been now on a small scale, and we see, uh, that's my personal experience I see on a household scale, a small business scale, uh, the solutions I just mentioned are really close to the market, uh, in my, uh, my opinion. Uh, this one is a bit further out. Um, thermal storage, 90% efficiency over the season. So what they will basically do is they load in the summer, big volume, and then they give it away in the winter. Um, what you see here is that they kind of aim for the net balancing part. And the one was mentioned in the beginning, why do we have smart grids to balance supply and demand? And this is a solution to, on a larger scale, really balance supply and demand. But we really see that there is not yet a critical event happening, no blackouts, no big thing happening. Why? People are moving in that direction yet. So there is not yet the, uh, the value, basically. Yeah? So I call the unknown value of net balancing. It's really making it difficult for them to make a business case. And if you make this difficult to make a business case, it's also harder to attract commercial finance, which also means you're farther from the market. So this is every time how kind of I look at it. Can you make the business case right now already based on the things you know? Can you from that attract uh, commercial money? And if you can attract commercial money, you're closer to the market. If it's difficult to do that yet, because for example, the value of balancing is unknown, uh, you're farther away. Are they able to attract finance? Yeah, they are able to attract finance, but really from um, the more the government sources, you're still, you're still in subsidies, um, and mere uh, kind of semi-government funding. So really not the commercial funding. It's difficult for them. And they need quite a lot, actually, to build something like this. <laughs> it's already amazing that they made their first uh, prototype. Uh, it's next to their office. It's really... What size is it? <laughs> what size? What size is um, huh. I've been there. It's, uh, it's kind of a... Quite a swimming pool, I can say. Uh, yeah, I think uh, 10 by 12, but 10 by 10 uh, the square. But then how deep? I don't know. I really don't know. But it's pretty, pretty deep. The biggest, uh, the biggest uh, one they're aiming for in their product range is costing 2.4 million. It's able to store 3.5 million kilowatt hour thermal. So how, how effective is this technology? The claim is that they can store the energy uh, with a loss of 10% only over six months. Including conversions, yes. Um, so coming more to the conclusionary statements, I would say I see two tracks in, uh, in smart grids. I see uh, track one, user prosumer track short midterm. That's basically all the ventures I mentioned that are pretty close to the market where it's really depending on the use, on the business case where you say, okay, I can save energy by doing this. I can save cost by doing this. Yeah? By, for example, uh, yeah, save energy with data, obviously, uh, you get insights and you save cost. And yeah? then you have a simple business case. I invest in a certain technology, uh, I get more insights and I can save my, on my energy bill. Uh, time shifting, okay, you can shift your demand uh, when, it's, uh, when it's cheaper. Uh, there's already a business case for that, um, when you have flexible billing, of course. Uh, the storage, same thing. I can generate, I can wait until I deliver it back to the grid, or I can use it myself, depending on what is the, uh, what is the rate at that moment. Um, so it's really, I think it's coming. 
already. It's there. People, the, the, the businesses I mentioned are making money. The last one is not yet. Making money is just uh, burning a lot of money. Uh, but for me, that's also more in this track too, where you see, okay, where we really get into net balancing uh, uh, type of business cases, which to me are not really uh, yet there. And I feel, okay, when the urgency is becoming more and more, yeah, when there's more uh, renewables coming to the grid, uh, when the penetration of electric vehicles is getting higher, and you really get into more uh, unbalances in demand and supply, these type of opportunities become more urgent, and then it will be also come close to the market. But for me, it's kind of a track two where I see a lot of hesitance to start. So I really start, track one is starting here, and yeah, they already started kind of, and track two is kind of in the first steps to get started. In what way is track one uh, influencing track two? Because a lot of people become consumer and solve problems at the local level. Uh, and the more regional level yeah. will not become a problem. Anymore. It will start later even. Yeah, it's pushing out. That's my feeling as well. And maybe they are waiting for that a bit eh, to see what's happening now. Uh, can we learn from that and can we maybe postpone certain <coughs> investments? Uh, because in the end, Smart Grid is all, all about uh, making investment in one area to make sure that other costs, uh, bigger costs about your infrastructure are not needed anymore. So in the end, it should be a cost saving on the overall system uh, level. So if we look at market and technology readiness, I see the startups in this area, so if we look at this track one, are, ready at, are able to attract external commercial funding. So at the, to me, a big indicator that they are viable, uh, have a viable business in three to five years. Um, these innovations have a simple business case. That's where I always start. If you start about, okay, I need to do revenue stacking where I have to uh, put value on net balancing and also on the business case of buying and uh, selling electrical power, to me, it's always a red flag that you are in a danger zone of uh, shifting your business out. Um, and I think the last point is really important because the area where I've been talking about is really in the home of the, uh, of the consumer or in the small, uh, small businesses or in the business area is not limited anymore to the original energy supplier. And you see industries uh, like telecom is getting involved, uh, ICT is getting involved, uh, building industry is actually getting involved. So you see three, four major industries getting involved and everyone wants a, pee, uh, or wants a piece of the pie. Um, and when you see that, uh, I think that's a dynamic where the startups can uh, can grow because then people from other industries will come in, try to take over the startups, for example, which is a way to accelerate your business, or try to cooperate with these startups. So it's really a kind of a level playing field for everyone, and that's uh, the dynamic where they can uh, benefit from. The other part of about the modern net balancing part is still, I think, more of a, I would not say party of the energy, typical energy uh, sector, but I see this part is really uh, open for everyone. So what about regulation? I just touched it briefly because it was not really part of my assignment, but just because we saw certain things uh, where I think regulation can help. Um, yeah, what I said in the beginning, if we, inf uh, if we really have smart meters and we have minute-by-minute uh, -minute billing or hour-by-hour -hour billing, a lot of innovations are gonna happen uh, just by itself. Um, drive standardization. Yeah, if you set the smart reader example, it's crazy that we have different set of standards, different set of requirements for every smart meter uh, in Europe. And then fiscal so incentives for storage solutions. That's actually part of something we mentioned in the roadmap, we believe, like we did with renewables, you can stimulate renewables quite a lot. Uh, storage can also be stimulated in that way. And that was the last part. So thank you for your attention uh, on this.